Hello, everyone, and welcome again to the Brown Center Spotlight Series. Uh, today, we have uh, first starting off Dr. Jean Smith, Assistant Professor of Biology. Uh, she will be speaking on cell fusion and yeast as re regulated by secretion. Again, thank you, Dr. Jean Smith, and uh, it's now yours. Well, thanks so much, Chris. Thanks for organizing this. This is great. So I'm excited to talk to you all about some research I've been doing recently on cell fusion. And so first of all, you know, why should you care about cell fusion? Why do I care? Why do I think it's really important to study? Well, this is because different fusion events are really important for eukaryotic life. And especially we see this throughout eukaryotic development, so development of humans. And so the first fusion event that we see is the fusion event that occurs between a sperm and an egg cell. And this is required to form that diploid zygote that goes on to develop to become an infant and then to become you know, all of us. And so this happens when these two cells physically uh, fuse together. A little bit later on in development, the cells that are going to form the placenta that come from that embryo actually have to fuse as well and this fusion event is required for implantation for pregnancy to continue. And then later on when skeletal muscles are developing we see the fusion of um, myoblast cells which are muscle precursors and this fusion has to happen to form these multinucleated muscle fibers that contract and allow us to do um, all of the wonderful things that we can do with our muscles. And so while these uh, fusion processes are super important and defects in any of them can cause a variety of problems related to human health, they're very difficult to study in these different systems, right? And so one of the ways that we can get around this is by studying the process in budding yeast or Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And these cells undergo a cell fusion event that's very similar to the events that happen in higher eukaryotes, but I'm literally talking about the kind of uh, yeast that you can go to the grocery store and buy to make bread, right? Um, so they're easier to work with and we don't have quite as many of those um, technical and, and um, ethical limitations as studying these processes in the higher eukaryotes. And so other things about yeast that make them really awesome for this process is that they can live as haploid organisms. And so these are organisms that have one copy of every chromosome or every gene. We have two mating types in budding yeast, mat A and mat alpha, and these can sort of be thought of like the human uh, male and female. But these cells can replicate asexually through mitosis or budding in this organism as these haploid cells. And so we can make genetic mutations at this level and then see what happens to the fusion process. And this is something that's very difficult to do in, in humans or higher eukaryotes. Now, when these cells sense cells of the opposite mating type, when they're close enough together, this is when we can see them grow towards each other. And once they come in close enough proximity, we get cell fusion that happens. This fused cell is now a diploid with two copies of every gene and can go on and divide asexually as a diploid. And depending on environmental conditions, we can also see these diploids go through meiosis and start the whole process back over again. And so I'm really interested in the step here at the middle where the cells are fusing. And what's important to note is that not only is it just cool to study this process in yeast, but um, genes and proteins that have been important in yeast fusion are conserved in higher eukaryotes and have been shown to function similarly in these higher cells. So we can ask these questions here and then relate them to fusion events in mammals. But fungal cell fusion is not really a trivial task. There's a lot of things that have to go right for this to work. And so if we start with our two uh, individual haploid cells, these cells have a plasma membrane here shown with that little black line. And then they have a cell wall that's surrounding the plasma membrane. And you can think of the plasma membrane like the skin and then the cell wall like a suit of armor that's protecting these organisms in their environment. And so I said that uh, these cells sense each other. Well, they do that by secreting pheromones. So A cells secrete A factor, alpha cells secrete alpha factor. And once they sense the pheromone, this initiates a protein cascade that causes the expression of many genes. And what this does is allows the cells to physically grow towards one another. This is called polarization. And we get these um, pear-shaped cells that are growing towards each other. 
once they get close enough together, because they have this cell wall on the outside of their cells, we now have this region right here where we want fusion to occur, but it has both of the cell's cell walls blocking that from happening. And so we actually have to degrade the, the cell wall right in the right spot for this to happen. Once we do that, the plasma membranes can come together and fuse, allowing the cytoplasms to mix. And then the last step of this process is for the two haploid nuclei to fuse and form one diploid nucleus. And so I'm interested in this step right here where the cell wall gets degraded, because if you think about the suit of armor reference, if you were to take off a piece of armor at a really in a, a bad time in battle, right, that could be very detrimental. And that's the same thing for the yeast cells. If they get rid of their cell wall in the wrong place or at the wrong time, they will die. And so we want to really know how this is regulated. And so we do know um, a couple of the molecular players, the proteins that regulate this process. And one thing that we've seen in um, detailed analysis of these steps going from having the two cells opposed to actually having them fuse is we see vesicles that localize on either side of the zone of cell fusion. And so this is electron microscopy of um, two cells that are mating. And so here this darker line is the cell wall and the uh, more gray line is the plasma membrane. And so these vesicles are mating specific and they localize on either side. And then as the cell wall degrades and the plasma membranes fuse, we see the vesicles essentially go away so that at the end, we don't have any there anymore. And so if we zoom in as to what we think is happening in this little cartoon of the cell wall and the plasma membrane in these cells, because of this um, observation, it has long been hypothesized that we have these fusion-specific vesicles that localize right to where the cells are going to fuse, the zone of cell fusion. And that these vesicles contain enzymes, which are shown here by these little Pac-Man uh, drawings, cartoons, that can break down the cell wall. And so what we think is happening is that this vesicle gets uh, secreted or undergoes exocytosis, and this will release those enzymes right in the exact spot to chew up the cell wall right where then the plasma membranes can fuse. And so not only the looking at the vesicles, but also some other molecular evidence has suggested that this could be true, but we really haven't ever been able to show it. So the first evidence is in looking at mutants that can't fuse. So um, this protein, Fuzz2, is a positive regulator of fusion. And if we have it around, it localizes on either side of the zone of cell fusion right where those vesicles are. And so we can see the vesicles with electron microscopy, but we can see where the protein is localized by tagging it with a fluorescent protein, such as GFP, and then performing microscopy on these fusing zygotes. And so this was from a study um, in 2008 that did that. And so if we have fuzz 2, the cells degrade their cell walls, they fuse the plasma membrane, everything's fine. But if we make a mutation in the genome where we completely get rid of this gene, fuzz 2 we now see a phenotype where the vesicles are still on either side. They're ready to go, but then they just get stuck there. They can never degrade the cell wall. And so these zygotes just have uh, the cell wall in between the two cells. And so this led to this idea that, okay, really it is these vesicles that are somehow promoting this process and that this protein phase two is regulating that. We also, uh, another line of evidence is we also know that there is a protein that has been shown to regulate secretion that localizes similarly to this region, the zone of cell fusion. And this protein is called CDC42. CDC42 is um, a highly conserved gene, and so in yeast and higher eukaryotes, it's really the master regulator of polarity. And it's a GTPase, and so GTPases um, can bind two different versions of a nucleotide. So um, they can either be bound by guanosine diphosphate, shown as GDP or excuse me, GDP here, there's two phosphate groups on it, and this is the inactive form of these GTPases. Now, when instead they bind to GTP, or triphosphate, this is the active form, 
of these genes. And there are certain proteins that do this that help them exchange the GDP for GTP. These are guanine exchange factors. And then these really act like switches, so we can also go from GTP to GDP. And so CAC42 is super important for yeast cells for their growth. You can't get rid of it. It's required for growth. And it plays many different ro roles throughout the yeast life cycle. For polarity, it's known to reorganize the cytoskeleton, um, reorganize, uh, polarize the cytoskeleton, excuse me. It's known to traffic um, proteins, undergo membrane trafficking, bring those proteins to areas where they need to be. And it's also known to promote vesicle secretion. So this is sort of getting at what we think might be happening. And because of this, CDC42 is required for both normal mitotic growth and for um, the polarization of cells during mating. And just to make it even more complicated, because, you know, it, it's not, science isn't easy enough, um, or isn't hard enough, excuse me, CDC42 functions at three different steps in this mating pathway. It's required for the response to pheromones, so the regulation, upregulation of certain genes. It's also uh, it's required for polarization, right, for the physical growth of these cells. But then we know that it is required for cell wall degradation as well. We have alleles of the protein that, uh, where we can get to this point, and then like the fuzz 2 deletion, we never get um, that cell wall degraded. And so research, previous research that I did in uh, graduate school also showed that this protein, CDC42, is localized right where those vesicles are. And so again, this is performing fluorescence microscopy. And so here we have a GFP tagged version of CDC42, and so it's going to glow green. And then we have FUS2 uh, tagged with M cherry, so it's going to be red. And when we did these imaging experiments, where only one of the mating partners has these fluorescently tagged proteins, what we saw was um, even though CDC42 is kind of all along the cell, because it has all of these other functions, but specifically in zygotes, it localizes to this focus right where those vesicles are, right where FUS2 is. And so we really think that it's, it's um, sort of the business end of cell wall degradation. degradation excuse me. And the last evidence we have towards this, right, that secretion is important and then this protein CDC42 might be involved, is uh, in 2001 there was a mutation in CDC42 isolated called CDC42-6. Now I said that CDC42 is super important for the cell so we can't get rid of it and oftentimes mutations cause the cells to die, which is not the goal here. But what we can do is have a temperature sensitive mutation. And how those work is that if you grow uh, these cells at usually lower temperatures, this is similar to room temperature, maybe not in sage because it's freezing in sage, but just for, is what it is, um, then we see roughly the wild type phenotype. And so the cells can be fine growing at this lower temperature. You can then move it up to the restrictive temperature, and then we see this mutant phenotype. And so this is what CDC 426 is. It's a temperature sensitive mutation. And this previous uh, study looked at cells with this mutation grown at either the permissive or restrictive temperature and found that uh, you do see a little bit of leakiness. We see a phenotype sort of at the um, permissive temperature as well, but it's not enough for them to die. But once we raise it up to this restrictive temperature, um, they saw an increase in vesicles per the cell. And so they concluded that this was a secretion-specific allele, that it's blocking the exocytosis of vesicles in general from the cells. And so work that I did was trying to figure out whether or not that allele also blocks fusion, right? And so how can we do this? Well, one of the common assays that I use and my students use is by using membrane dyes to quantify cell fusion and microscopy. I'm a little bit of a microscopy nerd. And so what this uh, does is we have this dye called FM464, and it's a lipophilic dye, so it can um, stick into membranes and fluoresce. And so here, if we look at our sort of cartoon model, we would get fluorescence all along the plasma membrane of these yeast cells. And so then we can ask, is there any plasma membrane still remaining in between these two cells? So here, if the cells have fused, we will see sort of one continuous cell with no plasma membrane in between. And if they haven't fused, we'll see that red line in between the two cells. So we can do this for many mating mixtures, we can quantify, and then get really an accurate representation of how fusion is working. 
And one thing that's important to note when we do these experiments is that we could get cell wall degradation from either side of this mating pair. And so because of this, uh, sometimes it's hard to actually detect what's going on in your cells that you're interested in looking at. So something we commonly do is we use what's called a, a fusion compromise cell, or essentially a, a mating partner that can't do cell wall degradation. One that, that I commonly use is a double deletion of FUS1 and FUS2, and these cells can't degrade the cell wall. And so then if we mate them against an experimental cell, say CDC42-6, we can ask, you know, really what is that allele doing in relation to cell fusion? Because the only cell wall degradation we, should, we see should be coming from that mating partner. And so you'll see that um, in, in some of my assays as we go along. And so when I did these experiments at the end of my graduate career, what I found was that the CUC42-6 allele, when compared to the wild type version, had a pretty drastic cell fusion defect only at the restrictive temperature. And so this led us to conclude, along with many controls that we did, that uh, really this secretion defective allele is blocking fusion, um, and this is because it's blocking the secretion of those vesicles. So we can sort of uh, add to our model here that CDC42 and um, FES2 as well, because they sort of work together, are really promoting this exocytosis of these vesicles. But there's still the question of really is this happening, right? But also what specific proteins are found in there? What are the things that are actually doing this? What are those little Pac-Man cartoons? And how can we detect this? How can we see if this is going on? And so to answer the first question, there was previous research that was done in the late 90s that found that these two genes, SCW4 and SCW10, encode proteins that are gluconases. And so this means that they can physically break down the polysaccharides that are found in the yeast cell wall. So this seems great. This is what we would be looking for in terms of those enzymes. And more research that they did is um, they mated cells that had both deletions of both SCW4 and SCW10 against each other. So in this mating mixture, there's none of those enzymes around, and they wanted to see what happened. And one of the ways, another way that we can test for if fusion happens is sort of going downstream and saying if everything works properly, we should be able to get a diploid. And so you can use media that only diploids can grow on. So if you put these mating mixtures on that media, then growth is an indicator of, of mating. And so this is what they did. And in this grid here, you have uh, one of the mating partners genotypes listed on the left and the other one listed on the top. And so what they found here is when you combine, um, when you mate that SCW4, SCW10 double mutant against a partner that is also a double mutant, we really get very few diploids being formed. And so this led to hi the hypothesis that these are really the enzymes that are doing that job. But it had still never been shown. And so we wanted to know if we could visualize SCW4 and SCW10 during fusion. Can we see where those proteins are? Can we see if they're getting exocytosed from the cells? So that would really be, you know, like the, the kicker enzyme to show that this is what's happening. Or assay, excuse me. And so originally, um, before my time, uh, students tried to make um, fluorescently tagged versions of these proteins. So for example, using something like GFP or RFP, that when it's um, made, when it's produced, it's going to fluoresce. And so it's a great thing to try, but unfortunately these fluorescent proteins can be pretty sensitive to pH changes. And we commonly see different pHs in vesicles. So for that reason, or potentially for others, who knows, uh, we could never get this to work. And so this kind of sat on the back burner for a little bit, trying to figure out how could we really show this. And recently, we decided to try a different version of this, which was to use a tag that instead of just being a fluorescent protein, it's what's called a fluorogen activating protein or a FAF tag. And so this tag itself isn't fluorescent. It doesn't show anything on its own. But it can specifically bind to a small molecule called a fluorogen, and when this interaction happens, and only when this interaction happens, do we see this fluorescence, do we see it light up? And so we thought this could be really great. Because what we could do with this 
is try to visualize exocytosis. So bringing back to our little model here, if we have SCW4 tagged with that FAP tag in the vesicle, we shouldn't see anything. But then if we use a fluorogen that's impermeable to the cell, so it can get through the cell wall, it can get to this intermembrane space, but it cannot get through the plasma membrane. So we should not see any fluorescence in this case, but if we see exocytosis, now the FAP tags are where the fluorogen is, and we should be able to see um, fluorescence only after secretion. On the flip side, as a control, and, and also to learn more things about this process, we can use a permeable flor fluorogen in the same sort of setup. But here, the permeable fluorogen actually can go through the plasma membrane. And so because of this, it could get into those vesicles, and we should be able to see fluorescence wherever that protein is in the cell. And so this project has really been a collaboration with my um, amazing grad school advisor, Mark Rose. Um, he uh, pretty much right as I left grad school from Princeton, he moved to Georgetown. Um, and Allison was a grad student when I was there at Princeton who helped with some of the original cloning. And then um, Ursula and Emily are in Mark's lab now. Ursula's a grad student and Emily is an undergrad. They're both extremely talented. And so we've been working together to try to get these assays to, to work. And so the original thing we needed to do was get these proteins tagged. And so the way that we did this was by cloning these genes onto plasmids with the tags using general molecular cloning methods. And so this would be a whole circular plasmid, but I'm just showing you the part that is important. And so here we have either SCW4 or SCW10 um, put with the FAP tag using their normal promoters that regulate transcription. We also made another version of this that put a transmembrane domain at the end of the, the gene, just in case we saw diffusion of the protein away really fast and we might need something to sort of anchor it to the membrane. And then we also made ones that used a different promoter. Um, and this is a mammalian promoter that was used in previous studies with this FAP tag. Um, and so we just figured that would be a good thing to try just in case. And the initial cloning happened um, a couple years ago, back in 2016, 2017, and initial assays were unsuccessful. We could never get any signal. Um, we couldn't really see the proteins being expressed. It was, it was not great. And so it, again, sort of sat on the back burner for a couple years. But then more recently, um, Mark and I have really brought this back um, into, into light. And part of that was by realizing that these genes, or the protein, SCW4 and 10, are being cleaved by proteases. And so they have consensus sites for both a KEX2 protease and a Yapsin protease. And so this paper looks specifically at SCW4 and mutated either the KEX2 consensus or the Yapsin consensus sequence, or both. And what they found was that when they mutated both of those sites, they now saw a larger full-length protein that was not getting cleaved. And so what we wanted to do then was do this in our SCW4 or SCW10 constructs and see if this allowed us to work, allowed the assay to work. And so I first compared the sequences of SCW4 and SCW10 and found these consensus sequences. And so SCW4 um, has both the KEX2 sequence and this lysine here that's important for Yapsin cleavage. And SCW10 also has that lysine arginine that was important that they mutated in this paper, but it didn't have the lysine there. So for SCW10, we only made um, the lysine arginine mutation. And so this is really a, the bulk of the work that I've been doing over the past year, starting in about September, once I was able to get back in the lab, is doing this um, DNA work because Mark's current students don't have as much experience with that. And so I've been making these mutations in the lab here and then sending it to them so that then they can do the functional assays. And so for the SCW, for all of the um, sequences that we have, for all of the constructs, I mutated those two residues to mutate the KEX2 site. And then for the SCW4 constructs, I also mutated the Yapsin mutant. And so throughout this process, I've made over 16 different plasmids um, throughout the past year. And so after that, Ursula and Emily took these constructs 
um, and put them into yeast cells and then asked if the proteins were being expressed. And so while this isn't the most beautiful Western blot you may have ever seen, if you've seen them before, um, what this shows is that in either the double KEX2 Yapsin mutant fab tagged SCW4, or in just the KEX2 mutant for SCW10, we are seeing the full length protein being produced. And there's more of it for SCW10 than SCW4, but that was a promising start, saying that we're getting this full length protein. And so uh, in these results, after doing many Westerns, we showed that the endogenous promoter works better than normal promoter. So that's the one that we're going to keep using moving forward. And so then they set out to just start doing these imaging experiments. And so in this first set here, we're going to use the impermeable fluorogen. So she should only see secretion when, or excuse me, only see fluorescence when it's secreted. And over here, you're seeing the reference image of these zygotes. And so these are two cells here that are trying to fuse, and same down here. And so here we're looking at SCW10 tagged with that KEX2 mutant, and we're mating it again against that fusion compromise mating partner. And so when they originally showed me these images, I, I freaked out because I was so excited because it was finally working. And so what they're seeing here is that SCW10, we see this, um, this fluorescence right at that zone of cell fusion in the only these mating cells. And they're currently working on taking more images of this, but we see some that look more like all across the zone of cell fusion. And this one is an example where maybe right there in the middle, it's starting to degrade the cell wall. They can also do the experiment with the permeable fluorogen. And so what they've seen initially here is there are some cells where you see the protein kind of right under the cell wall, maybe getting primed and ready to be secreted. And then there are other cells where you see a little bit of that, but you also see um, the protein sort of throughout the cell. And this um, is likely showing how the, these proteins are being trafficked through vesicles to that zone of cell fusion. And so in conclusion, we've really been able to uh, create these constructs and optimize this assay to be able to use this FAP assay to visualize secretion during fusion, which is it's just awesome. And we've been able to use this to show that SCW4 and 10 are likely secreted so specifically during fusion. Now, I only showed you the SCW10 images um, because I saw the SCW4 images for the first time last Friday, but they also look very similar and very promising. And so future work is uh, quantifying these phenotypes, quantifying the images, um, also performing time-lapse imaging so that we can really see, um, hopefully, it's awesome if we can see that burst of fluorescence right when the, the cell wall starts to break down. Um, there are some other constructs that we're going to image, like the ones with the transmembrane domain. And then we can really use this as a tool to ask a lot of questions here, right? Is secretion dependent on CDC42 like we hypothesized? Is it dependent on FUS2, on any of those other fusion proteins? Can we do this in combination with membrane staining to try to see when we start getting fusion? Um, you know, looking at co-localization, there's a whole host of experiments that can be done, um, both here and at Georgetown, uh, to, to really directly um, look at this process. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. Thank the Brown Center for, for putting this on. Um, especially thank my wonderful advisor, Mark. It's been so fun to work with him again. Um, his great students, the Stetson Biology Department for helping me set up a lab in a pandemic. Um, I never thought I'd say that. And obviously the funding sources, so my Stetson Summer Grant, and then I also had a Willa Dean Lowry Award um, that allowed me to purchase some equipment that was necessary for this. So I'd be with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, we already have one from Dr. Missy Gibbs. You said that cell wall degradation and cell fusion can happen even if only from one side, but does degradation occur as well if only one cell is doing the degrading? Does it take longer? Yeah, so that's a great question, Missy, and the answer is yes, and it does take longer. So if only one cell is doing it, um, we do see a decrease in the total number of zygotes that can fuse, and a lot of that's because when we do these experiments, we stop them after a certain amount of time, and it does take longer for that to happen. Um, but that can be actually really good for us because it means we can sort of slow the process down and try to catch those events as they're occurring. Sorry, I just saw the chat, but thanks for, for that, Chris. <laughs> thanks.
Thanks, Terry. <laughs> I like giving talks, so that helps. <laughs> I'll tell Anna you said that, though. Well, cool. I'm happy to chat about this whenever, um, if anybody has any questions or anything they want to talk about. Um, but I'm also happy to hand it over to Sean to, to sh talk to us about his awesome stuff. If no one else has a question, we'll move on. We'll also have time at the end as well to, uh, to have both answer questions, it seems, because we're, we're a little ahead of time as well. But does anyone else have qu any question? Again, you can turn on your mic. You should be able to turn on your microphone and ask a question if you wish. All right. Well, thank you very much. Oh, Dr. Oscar. Oh, did I hear someone? Oh, that was just me. I just said thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Becklin, at this time I'll be uh, presenting uh, or introducing you, so give me a few seconds and uh, then we'll get on with your uh, video. Sounds good, Chris. Okay, now we have Dr. Sean Becklin, Assistant Professor of Biology, and he will be presenting on identifying reservoirs of tick-borne pathogens in prairie rodent communities. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Beckman, and it's now yours to take away. All right, thank you very much, Chris, for the introduction, and thank you everyone for attending today. Um, like Chris said, I'm gonna be presenting on some of the research that's been going on in my lab for the last, well, few years now, looking at reservoirs of tick-borne pathogens in prairie ecosystems. Um, when it comes down to it, I'm a mammal guy and I'm a rodent guy and I just geek out about studying small furry things. Um, I think mammals are really integral um, in a lot of ecosystems for a lot of reasons. They have a massive amount of biodiversity. Uh, as Terry Farrell will be happy to tell you, they serve as food for lots of things. Um, they're really great indicator species of how ecosystems are doing, but they also often get a really bad bum rap. Um, and that's because they're very commonly associated with disease, fairly or otherwise. You know, we have a number of diseases that we commonly associate with rodents, things like bubonic plague, for example, West Nile virus, uh, Leishman leishmaniasis, and probably one you're very familiar with, Lyme disease, are all directly or indirectly associated with rodents. Um, you know, our prairie dogs here, for example, serve as a modern uh, reservoir of bubonic plague and certainly historically rats have been associated with early outbreaks of plague. Uh, ground squirrels are known to serve as reservoirs of uh, West Nile virus. Your wood rats are known to carry leishmaniasis. And your white-footed mouse, Paramiscus, uh, Paramiscus leucopus, here is known to be the primary reservoir of Lyme disease in the United States and the primary reservoir of a lot of other things as well. And we're going to spend some time talking about them today. Hey, Dr. Beckman. I yes. think you're, are you flipping through the uh, slides right now? Yeah. It is not showing. Oh, there we go. Now it is showing. Uh, so. Okay. Let me, so is it, okay, now what? It's is just it showing, showing like the, it's not showing the presentation. It's showing the sort of, like the, the, PowerPoint, but not the presenting. You may have if that makes an application sense. instead of the screen huh. itself to share, and that's what happens sometimes with it when you're sharing. Um, so I'm sorry. What was that, Chris? What can I? Is it something uh, I? You hit share screen and share application. Make sure you share screen and not the application itself. Okay. That. So failing. Okay. Cool. Um. All right. So let's do the. So just share entire screen. Yes, sir. All right, let's do that and let's switch over again and let's see how is that looking? Well, now it's not showing me anything. How's that looking now? Can you all see it or are you seeing yeah. my presenter mode? Now it's showing. Uh, it's, it's showing the presenter mode. Yeah. Okay, so let me see if I can switch out of presenter mode. Um, How's that? Is it showing now? Perfect. Thank you. Okay, cool. So like I was, I'll just backtrack one slide. So like I was saying, we associate lots of different uh, diseases with these rodent species, things like bubonic plague, 
West Nile virus, leishmaniasis, and Lyme disease, just as a few examples. And certainly we know that prairie dogs serve to harbor bubonic plague contemporarily, and historically we associated this with rats throughout Europe. Ground squirrels are known to harbor West Nile virus. Wood rats harbor leishmaniasis. And our friend, the white-footed mouse here, Paramiscus leucopus, harbors Lyme disease, along with lots of other things. But truth be told, it's not the rodent's fault. Um, it's these guys who are really at fault. Um, these are arthropod vectors. These are the things that actually transmit many of these pathogens. So fleas, for example, are known to transmit plague. Mosquitoes are known to transmit West Nile virus. Sand flies are responsible for transmitting leishmaniasis. And ticks, uh, sorry, Missy, are known to transfer Lyme disease among many other things. So the arthropod vector here is the thing that actually moves the disease around. And we're gonna focus in largely on ticks today because they are one of the major vectors of disease, of uh, various different diseases here in the United States. So to give you a little background on how this process works, the ticks are not actually born with the pathogen in their body. What happens is a larval tick will hatch out of an egg here and ticks feed on blood. And these little tiny ticks, we sometimes call them seed ticks because they're about the size of a poppy seed or a sesame seed, will find something to feed on, very commonly a rodent. And if that rodent is carrying a pathogen, when they take blood in from that rodent, they will then acquire that pathogen. That larval tick will then go through a molt and move into its second life stage, its nymph life stage, now carrying the pathogen inside of its uh, salivary glands. When that nymph goes to take its second meal in this second life stage, it may very commonly feed on another rodent. If that rodent's uninfected, it's now going to infect it, creating a new reservoir for that particular pathogen, spreading it among the rodents. The rodents aren't spreading it to other rodents, rather the tick spreads it from rodent to rodent. At this nymph stage though, if you happen to be walking through the woods or walking through the grass and this tick grabs on you instead of onto a rodent, it could also spread that to you. Or if your dog's walking through the woods, it can spread it to your dog. After going through that nymphal life stage, it's then going to go through another molt and become the adult tick, that larger tick that we most commonly see. And that adult tick very rarely feeds on rodents. This is when it's going to feed on larger mammals. This may be something that's normally found in its environment like a deer, which is not really gonna be affected by the bacteria or the pathogen and kind of just goes on its merry way. Or it could be a human or a uh, dog or another animal that might develop the infection. So what we see here is that the ticks are serving as the vectors, transmitting the pathogens, but they have to first acquire that pathogen from a reservoir, very commonly a rodent that harbors the pathogen, but isn't affected by the pathogen. It doesn't develop symptoms of it, which is, which actually allows that pathogen to persist in that rodent throughout its life because its immune system doesn't mount a defense against it. And like I said before, in the United States, this animal right here, Paramiscus leucopus, is the most common reservoir of tick-borne pathogens. And one of the reasons for that is the white-footed mouse is pretty widespread throughout the US. So if we actually look at the range of the white-footed mouse here, we can see it covers most of the United States, ranging up into Canada and all the way down into Central America, uh, throughout Mexico, and even moving over a little bit into other parts of Central America. But notice, we don't find the white-footed mouse down here in the southeastern US, and we don't find the white-footed mouse out west, west of the Rockies. Yet if we look at the prevalence maps of some of our tick-borne pathogens, and we'll take a look at Lyme disease because it is the most prevalent one in the United States, we see that yes, it's found in places white-footed mice are found, but it's also found in other places that white-footed mice aren't found. 
like the southeastern United States, and like out west in Washington, Oregon, and even some pretty large pockets out here in California. So it begs the question, what's carrying these pathogens in places where the white-footed mouse doesn't exist? You know, we had 30,000 confirmed cases of Lyme disease in the U.S. last year, Th another 13,000 probable cases, and those cases were found in all 50 states, not just the places where white-footed mice exist. One place we can take a look at and dive into a little bit is up here in Illinois, where I've done a lot of my research. And in fact, if we look in Illinois, we see that there's actually been a massive increase in the incidence of Lyme disease in human populations over the course of the 21st century. Now, some of this certainly just has to do with reporting, but there's certainly been an increase from case, less than 50 cases in the turn of the century to up to well over 250 cases a year over the last few years. Moreover, where we see these cases centered in Illinois, I'm gonna flip back for a second to show you this, up here in the northern part of the state and throughout southern Wisconsin here are areas where we don't see a lot of white-footed mice because these are areas that are prone to having large amounts of grassland habitats. And white-footed mice have a preference for forested habitats. So what's going on in Illinois? Because historically, about 60% of Illinois was covered in prairie. Down here in this map on the left, we can see the green area is the forested area. The yellow area is the historic prairie area. Historically, there were over 22 million acres of prairie in Illinois. As of 1978, though, that number was actually reduced down to about 2,800 acres. As you can see here on the right from this 2007 land cover map, where the forested area is still highlighted in green and most of it still exists, but most of the rest of this that was prairie has been converted for other use. And what's basically happened is prairie areas like this, like the Nechusa grasslands up in um, north central Illinois, have been converted over from prairie, which is very, very fertile soils, to farmland, which is very, very fertile soil until it's not anymore, where farmers were using it for agricultural purposes. The thing is the rodents that inhabited those prairies didn't necessarily leave when they got converted over to farmland. Things like your 13-line ground squirrel, um, Ichthodomys tridecim lineatus, your meadow jumping mouse, Zapis hudsonius, and your meadow vole, Microtus pennsylvanicus, continued to inhabit these farmlands. And these farmlands have been used for hundreds of years. And so eventually, very commonly, what happens is like we see here in this map, where we've got a lot of farmland up here and some farmland over here, is this farmland goes fallow. It runs out of nutrients. Farmers get tired of investing money into fertilizing this land. It's not producing as many resources anymore. And so they sell it off. And it gets converted into suburban habitat, like we see here, these suburban developments. Or in some cases, like we see down here in the lower right, it gets, tur it gets um, bequeathed over to a conservation district or to a natural resource uh, organization, and they try to restore it back to the native prairie that it used to be. The thing is, again, the rodents don't go away when this happens. They continue to live in these areas. Um, in fact, in northern Illinois, it is a very you know, common thing to walk out your back door in the morning and hear a chorus of your ground squirrels in your backyard chirping at each other. Um, what this does, though, is it now brings humans through residential activity and through recreational activity into close contact with these rodents, potentially into close contact with ticks that can transmit tick-borne pathogens. And so this brings me to my question of interest, which is, are these arthropod-borne pathogens found in prairie-dwelling rodents in northern Illinois? We know that, it's, that these pathogens are found in Illinois. We know people are getting infected with them. We know the white-footed mouse isn't as common here, though. So we know something else has to come and has to be carrying it. And we know that we're seeing increasing incidences of it, which are correlates to increasing interaction 
between humans and these areas. So is there an association there? So what we hypothesized is that arthropod-borne pathogens are present in multiple rodent species in these prairie habitats. In particular, I'm interested in knowing if these species represent reservoirs of these pathogens. Do they harbor them and carry them throughout life and spread them to these ticks? And I predict that several of them are reservoirs of a number of different pathogens, but today I'm gonna to talk to you about three in particular. Borrelia burgdorferi, the causative agent of Lyme disease. Bartonella, which is a genus of pathogenic bacteria that cause things ranging from cat scratch fever to trench fever to more nondescript uh, issues like endocarditis and myocarditis. And three of your Ehrlichia species, Ehrlichia canis, which causes um, canine ehrlichiosis, a very common veterinary pathogen and Ehrlichia ewingi and Ehrlichia muris, which cause human Ehrlichiosis, which is a rising um, tick-borne pathogen in the United States. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And as I'm going through the this today, I wanna kind of try to highlight for you that most of this work is due to the activity of some very dedicated undergraduate students over the last few years that this work would not have been possible without. And so I wanna to try to remember to highlight them as I go. So in order to do this work, we've got to get rodents. And so what we did is in that previous map that I showed you that restored prairie that we were looking at, I went there. That's the Distillery Road Conservation Area in Boone County, Illinois. Uh, the Distillery Road Conservation Area is a form of farmland that has been restored or is in the process of being restored to tall grass prairie ecosystem. And we set traps in two patches of that prairie one that was first restored in 2003 up here, patch A, and one that was restored in 2010 down here, patch B, that still has a farming silo sitting on it. We set 120 live traps across these two patches, so 60 in each patch. We trapped on them two to four times per week from mid-May to late August, every year between 2014 and 2018, but I'm only gonna present data today through 2017. Uh, and then we collected demographic data on the animals that we trapped. The way we did that was we set these traps that look like this, they're super high tech, metal mesh and a soup can, really high tech stuff here. Once we first captured an animal, so in this case here, we have a, um, a ground squirrel and here are two of my research students, Taggart and Rhonda, that were really helpful to me over the first few years of this research. We would handle the rodent, like Paloma is showing us here, identify it to species, and collect demographic data on it. What species do we have? What sex is it? What age class does it form into? Is it a juvenile or an adult? Is it reproductively active? Has it ever been reproductively active? Collecting that sort of demographic data. We then would put it in a Ziploc bag and weigh it to determine the weight of it, as several of my students are showing you here. And we would collect a tissue sample from it, um, either from taking a toe clip or taking an ear punch from that animal. When we were working in Illinois, we used toe clips because it was a way to also identify where they were from geographically, which allowed us to track them without actually having to put uh, tags on them. Most of these are burrowing rodents, and so ear tags get ripped out really easily toe clips at least let us identify where they came from geographically. We take that tissue sample and we bring it back in the lab in order to analyze it uh, and do a number of different uh, genetic techniques in order to try to find out whether or not the disease was present. So what we did is we extracted whole genomic DNA from the rodent tissue samples using an ethanol precipitation method. And basically what we have there then is a whole bunch of rodent DNA maybe with some pathogenic bacterial DNA in there. So it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And what we use is a tool called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, to try to target that needle if it was present. So what polymerase chain reaction lets us do is it lets us amplify a specific region of DNA that we're interested in. In this case, the pathogen's DNA, not the bacteria, not the rodent's DNA. And so in the first case, looking at uh, Lyme disease, we used uh, primers that were specific to two genes of Borrelia burgdorferi, the flagellin B gene and outer surface protein B. We amplified these uh, using PCR, 
and then we visualize the results on a 2% agarose gel. For those of you not familiar with gel electrophoresis, basically what happens is you load your DNA up into the wells up here, you run an electrical field through it, and the DNA runs through this gel and separates out by size. And what we do is we go in and we look for a band of the right size if it were the bacterial DNA. In this case, these bands here at about 497 base pairs would be our bacterial DNA of interest from uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. If we find that, we then cut that out and we send it off for DNA sequencing to verify that it is what we think it is and compare it to an, uh, the NCBI database to identify for sure that that's what we're looking at. And so a lot of this work was done here at Stetson a few years ago by uh, Chelsea Ferrer, who was doing research on Ichthydomys tridecim lineatus and Zapus hudsonius, and um, Amira Shaw, who was looking at Microtus pennsylvanicus uh, and Microtus ochrogaster in my lab to see what was going on with Borrelia burgdorferi in these. And what we found is that, yeah, it is definitely present. Um, out of about 950 animals that we sampled, about one third of those animals harbored Borrelia burgdorferi. And we can see here um, that those prevalence rates ranged from a little over 20% to up to nearly 40% in the case of the meadow vole. And we do see that there was a significant effect of species here with certain species being more likely to carry it than others. We also see though that there's also a temporal effect going on here that if we break this out by year, we can see that in three of our four species, we actually see this drop off be at, uh, in 2016 and 2017 in prevalence rate dropping down from 2016. I'll talk about what I think might be going on there in just a minute. Note we don't see this here in our meadow vole, in, uh, in our prairie vole, Microtus ochrogaster. That's likely an uh, artifact of sample size though. Of our voles that live on that prairie, only about 8% of them are uh, prairie voles. So there's not a whole lot of samples there to actually be able to tease apart um, what's going on within that species. Um, but in our other more abundant species, we do see this temporal variation. And so to kind of just do a quick dive into the Lyme data, the Borrelia data, what we see is that we over have an overall high infection rate among uh, rodent taxa. And in fact, all four species exceed levels that of um, Borrelia burgdorferi of what is known to exist in Paramiscus leucopus in the upper Midwest. Uh, work by Lee and Rydzewski in both Illinois and in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota show rates of about 15 to 20% infection in white-footed mice. And we're seeing well over 20% in all of our species that we tested here. We also see this temporal variation that exists within species. And we think that this may be tied to prescribed burns. Um, while we can't really tease this apart right now, some research uh, in South Carolina, as well as out in California in the chaparral out there, has shown that prescribed burns can be used as an effective way to, um, to tamp down levels of tick-borne pathogens. Um, in those environments. And so we think that the same sort of thing might be happening in prairie ecosystems, that we see a drop off after a burn. We don't know if that we then get a bump back up later on then or not though. Certainly based on what we've seen in, our, uh, in, the, in this study, um, microtus species, the voles certainly do appear to be residents of Borrelia in prairie ecosystems. And this confirms previous research that was done out in Colorado that showed that voles are competent for Borrelia, so they are able to pass it on. Now we know that there's competence and there's prevalence as well. Uh, and it appears that both ichthydomies, the ground squirrels, and the meadow uh, jumping mice, Zapus hudsonius, may be reservoirs. What we need is follow-up research on this to confirm if there's reservoir competency there, if they can be passed on, or if they're just dead end hosts. But certainly with this type of prevalence, it looks like we've got a couple of, uh, several novel reservoirs here in prairie systems. So moving on from Borrelia, I had another group of students that were interested in looking at other bacteria. And so one group of those bacteria that I mentioned before are the Bartonella. 
And so here I've got uh, two of my students, Fernanda Chavez uh, and Haley Avery, as well as another student, uh, Malcolm Engelbrecht, who's finishing up his medical degree at the Uniformed Services School right now. We're interested in looking at Bartonella and seeing what the prevalence of Bartonella was in these same groups of rodents. So Bartonella is this kind of facultative intracellular parasite. Um, it actually infects red blood cells and the lining of um, blood vessels. Uh, and currently, of the Bartonella species that are out there, 11 of these are known to be human pathogens. These pathologies range from, as I mentioned before, cat scratch fever to endocarditis, inflammation of the lining of the heart, myocarditis, uh, uh, inflammation of the muscular layer of the heart, uh, and causing increased vascular growth that is actually associated with tumor formation as a result of this bacterial infection. Additionally, these are merging pathogens in tropical areas of the world. So studying Bartonella is becoming an increasingly important thing as uh, they are emerging in more and more places. The thing about Bartonella is they're not just spread by ticks. In fact, we don't even know if ticks spread them at all. We know they're spread by lice, by sand fleas, by biting flies, by just about anything that takes a blood meal. Um, and interestingly, as opposed to Borrelia, where animals can't be born with the pathogen, we know that in certain species, in certain vole species, for example, vertical transmission does occur. Mothers can pass this on to their offspring. But in general, we don't know a lot about what reservoirs exist of these pathogens. Uh, Hardeen et al. identified that uh, Richardson's ground squirrel out west may be a reservoir. And Kasoy uh, et al. have done a bunch of work that have identified it in white-footed mice, uh, sigma on hispidus down here in the southeast, and potentially vole species as well. But there hasn't really been a comprehensive look at what species in any particular ecosystem might serve as reservoirs. So what we did is we took that same genetomic DNA that we had previously collected from rodents, and we targeted it again with PCR, except instead of looking for Borrelia DNA, we looked at two genes in the Bartonella genome, the 16S23S intergenic spacer region and the synth citrate synthase gene. And we targeted these using primers that are specific to the genus Bartonella. We then visualized those on a 2% agarose gel. And if we got what a, a band of the right size, we cut that out and we sent that out for sequencing, not just to say, is it Bartonella, but what species of Bartonella is that? And that was the work of Giselle Rojas here at Stetson, who graduated last year with her psychology degree. Um, and she worked really hard on getting those sequences done, analyzing those sequences, and identifying those strains. And she and I published on that uh, this research not too long ago. And what we found is somewhat of a different picture than we see in Borrelia. Uh, here, a lower percentage, 23% of our samples were positive overall, and we do see a very big species difference here. With Ictodomius tridecim lineatus, the 13-line ground squirrel showing nearly a 40% infection rate, whereas our other species showed levels down around 20 or even a little bit lower than that. Additionally, we don't see our temporal variation like we saw in uh, Borrelia as well. And I think what's going on here is due to the possibility of vertical transmission and due to the fact that there are so many different arthropod, arthropod vectors that could be transmitting this back and forth, particularly ones like fleas and that live on the host and don't just feed from it and then leave, we might not be seeing that effect of prescribed burns tamping things down near as much. We do see some effect going on here in our um, meadow vole, but we really don't know the source of that other than to say that meadow vole populations are highly cyclical, so it may actually be tied to uh, normal population fluctuation. And when we get into Giselle's work on the uh, individual um, strains, what we actually see is that the strains are not uniformly distributed across species. Uh, Ictodomius tridecim lisiniatus, for example, harbors only one strain of uh, Bartonella, Bartonella washoensis, which is known to be associated with cardiac conditions uh, in individuals in the northwestern US. And that pathogen actually isn't found in any of our other species. All three of our other species 
Harbor Bartonella grami, which causes uh, endocarditis in people. And our meadow vole here was the only one that we found that harbored this third pathogen, Barth Bartonella vinsonii, which instead of causing endocarditis, causes myocarditis, inflammation of the muscular layer of the heart. So we get a very interesting picture when we look at this at the level of the strain of the bacteria. What we do see is that Bartonella is prevalent though in all four of these species. And these rates are pretty consistent with what is known from related species. Among your European voles, for example, we see about a 20 to 27% infection rate. Uh, and our voles in our uh, prairie ecosystem have the, are consistent with the lower end of that. Um, whereas ictodomies had almost a 40% infection rate, which is nearly equivalent to the 37% that Hardeen found in the Richardson's ground squirrel in the Western US and Western Canada. We also see little interannual variation in infection rate. We do know that I tridecim lineatus is actually only the second known reservoir now of Bartonella washoensis in the world. Uh, and is in the only one that is known to be outside of the western northwestern U.S. And both Bartonella microtis and uh, both Zapis hudsonius and microtis species do appear to be potential reservoirs of Bartonella grami. I want to wrap up by talking about what we're currently doing in the lab today. Um, so this past uh, semester, uh, past year really, we've been working heavily looking at a third group of pathogens, the Ehrlichiae which are obligate intracellular parasites that infect white blood cells. Um, currently, there are four species of Ehrlichia that are known to cause human, that are known human pathogens. They cause these nondescript flu-like symptoms, which make them hard to identify. But if those conditions uh, persist, they uh, inf actually infect white blood cells and can cause hemorrhagic disorders, immunocompromise, and possibly even death. And these are actually transmitted by a number of different hard-bodied ticks, not just one species. But what we do know is that there's a general lack of information on reservoirs, particularly of small mammal reservoirs. Yet when we look at cases of ehrlichiosis in the United States, we see a pretty sharp increase over the course of the 21st century from fewer than 250 cases in 2000 to over 1,750 cases in 2018. And a study published last year actually showed that there are several hot spots where we see an increase in ehrlichiosis cases in the US, down here in Florida, um, in parts of the Midwestern United States, including Northern Illinois, as well as some places out West. And so what we, and by we, I mean my student Christian Berberich and Paloma Avila have been doing over the last year is using that whole genomic DNA that we collected amplifying the 16S rRNA um, gene uh, using Ehrlichia specific primers, and then following up with primers specific to different species, Ehrlichia canis, which affects dogs, Ehrlichia chaffiensis, which affects humans, Ehrlichia hewingi, which affects humans, and Ehrlichia muris, which also affects humans. And what we, again, we look for is the presence of a um, a band of the right size. We cut this band out, send it out for DNA sequencing, and then identify what species of Ehrlichia is present, if it is Ehrlichia. Like I said, most of this has really been the dedicated work of Christian, who has been in the lab working multiple times a week since the middle of first semester, and none of this would be done without him. So I can't speak enough about the hard work that he's done on this, um, as well as the work that Paloma did earlier looking at Ehrlichia muris in it. Her work is a little less exciting because as you can see from this graph, the uh, Ehrlichia muris was non-existent. She screened a whole bunch of samples and we found no evidence of Ehrlichia muris. Um, more on that in just a minute. Um, what Christian has found for us though is that we do have about 31% of our samples so far are positive for Ehrlichia canis, a little over 16% positive for Ehrlichia ewingi. We do see a species effect in both of these pathogens though with voles being significantly more likely than ground squirrels to harbor Ehrlichia canis, and with both um, ground squirrels and voles being significantly more likely to harbor Ehrlichia ewingi than meadow voles, which have a very, very low prevalence of it. 
So what we know so far, and we've only got a couple of years worth of data on this, we're still working through this one at the moment though, is that no animals are infected with Ehrlichia muris. This suggests either a lack of reservoir competency in the species that we're looking at, which may indicate that Paramiscus leucopus is the only reservoir of Ehrlichia muris, or that there's a restricted range of this pathogen. This pathogen's only been identified so far in Minnesota and Northern Wisconsin, so it may not have migrated far enough south yet for us to find it. We do know that all three species do harbor Ehrlichia canis though, at levels that are greater than have been seen in any other reservoirs, uh, whether we're looking at rodents, raccoons, or other canids, um, uh, infection rates range from 5% to 20% throughout North America, and we're looking at greater than 20% in all of our rodent species here. By comparison, in Ehrlichia ewingi, we can say that Z. Hudsonius is definitely very unlikely to be a competent reservoir or Ehrlichia ewingi due to its low prevalence. But what we did find interesting is that preliminary uh, analysis of some co-infection data suggests that co-infections occur significantly more with Ehrlichia ewingi and Ehrlichia canis than would be expected by chance. So that's something we want to follow up on in the future. So to wrap up, because I know I'm running over, what does it all mean? Well, it means that prairie ecosystems do harbor both human and veterinary tick-borne pathogens at high prevalence rates. And that non-paramiscus rodents in those ecosystems serve important roles as pathogen reservoirs. And uh, as a consequence of this, increased use of these habitats due to suburbanization uh, in the upper Midwest and due to increased recreation in these natural areas do create opportunities for uh, vectors such as ticks to transmit these pathogens from rodents to humans and animals. So where we hope to go next with this is we wanna finish up screening Ehrlichia canis and Ehrlichia ewingi. We wanna move into screening Ehrlichia chafensis, uh, which I have a student, uh, Christina Mickens, who just got a shore grant to work on this summer. So we're gonna follow up with that. And then the, uh, her and Christian and I are hoping to get this written up. I wanna move in and look at a couple of other tick-borne pathogens, the anaplasmae uh, and the babesias and see what is going on with those in this system. And then I wanna look back and combine all this data and look and see if we have any significant co-infections going on uh, to see if there's any sort of situation where one pathogen is making uh, rodents more or less likely to be infected with another pathogen. So with that, I would like to acknowledge all of the undergraduates who have made all of this work possible, as well as the Boone County Conservation District and the Illinois DNR for allowing me to do the work. Terry Farrell for help with actually teaching me how to do all of the statistics that have been so much easier to do on this. And both Stetson University and Stetson Biology for helping me get things established here, as well as a number of funding sources uh, for this. So with that, I will gladly take any questions. All right. So I'm just scrolling through the chat to see if uh, there were any questions in there. <laughs> we, we have I have a question if, if, if nobody else wants to go. This is Josh. Hey, Josh. Yeah, that's, that's really, both of these presentations were super interesting, although I'm not sure I have the requisite background to understand all the details. But one question uh, that, Sean, that, that, that occurred to me is, you know, all right, so it's not, it's not just the, uh, what are the, the, the white-footed, my, the uh, white-footed mice. Yeah, it, it's a bunch of other rodents, but that that sort of prompts the question: like, what rodents don't U.S. rodents don't carry these pathogens? And then, um, right. But I, I'm, I'm sure there's an answer to that question. But the follow-up would be something like: like, do you have any speculations as to as to what it is that these carrier rodents have in common uh, that makes them susceptible uh, to carrying so the pathogens? So that, that's a good question. Some of it certainly, uh, certainly it has to do with whether or not the rodent's immune system is gonna mount immune response to this. Does the rodent's immune system recognize this as a foreign invader and then try to attack it and destroy it? And does the rodent's uh, physiology allow, it, allow the um, pathogen to reproduce in that environment? And so we certainly do see a lot of variation in this. And there certainly are many rodents that are not uh, competent reservoirs 
of various different pathogens, uh, like Ehrlichia uingi in the um, metal in the meadow jumping mouse. That just doesn't seem like it's going to work out uh, as a reservoir. Um, really, what we need to do, honestly, is take it as a case by case basis and look at this as an ecosystem level uh, and screen multiple organisms in different ecosystems in different geographic locations to know what's going on. Uh, and know whether we're looking at dead end hosts or competent reservoirs so that we can better understand the transmission cycle, uh, which is now kind of where my research is going, doing the same sort of thing down here in Florida, where the white foot mouse doesn't exist, but we have many of these pathogens present to try to figure out who's carrying it and then why they're carrying it. Thank you. I have to go, but thanks, thanks to both of you. Thank you. Jean, did you have a question? Yeah. So. Uh, Actually, it works nicely because Taylor's off your answer to that. Um, so I'm I'm thinking about your last research, where your your last results, sorry, where you saw that you're not seeing that one specific pathogen, and I'm wondering, shockingly, going a little more nitty gritty into that here, uh, like, are there any kind of molecular differences between those pathogens and the host that you might think is the reason why they can't act as a as a reservoir, right? So that's a great question. I think yes. Um, so the um, Ehrlichia canis is, uh, affects granulocytes. Uh, it's a granulocytic ehrlichiosis. So it targets neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. By comparison, Ehrlichia ewing I actually targets monocytes and macrophages in particular. Uh, and so I'm, and this is guesswork now at this point, um, but what I would think is going on is that since they're affecting different cell types, that there's something about the monocytic um, cell membrane uh, proteins in um, the Zapis species that um, somehow prevent them from being infected and carrying it, whether it's a heightened immune response to it, whether it's that the cell membrane just doesn't recognize it in order to allow it to infect, uh, is a good question and a big question. Interestingly, the Zapis species, the, the meadow jumping mice, belong to a group of uh, rodents that are actually descended from old world species, whereas your voles are new world rodents and your ground squirrels are your skiards, your squirrel group. So they're a very distantly related group of rodents. So there may be something about their monocytes that make them non-susceptible. Yeah, cool. Thanks. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. I'm happy to talk to anyone afterwards as well, of course, but I'll turn it back over to Chris then. Okay, thank you very much to both of you again. We really appreciate it. Uh, great turnout. Thank you everyone for attending uh, this and supporting your uh, professors here. Um, have a great day.